Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on controlling parallel generators for maximizing reliability. For today's webinar, you can expect to become familiar with synchronization, switching device options and robustness, load sharing methods, removing a single point failure, load sequencing, redundancy at a, redundancy at a system level, communications, hardening, and operating through failures. For today's webinar, I wanna invite you to use the question box. This is located in the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. If you can go ahead and put your questions in there throughout, we will answer those in a live Q&A session towards the end. Um, you can also enter questions at that time. Get ready for polls. We are gonna have a few throughout, one prompted, if you can choose the options on your screen. Um, We'll give you a few seconds to do that and then see everyone's results. Um, you'll get an exit survey as you leave the webinar today. If you can take the time to fill out those and put your answers in, um, that'll be much appreciated. And lastly, you'll get a post-event email sent to your um, inbox tomorrow that has a link to the recording of this free, of this webinar, as well as a link to the free in-person training if you wanna request one. My name is Laura Unger. I'm an industrial manager here at Generac. And with this, I'd like to turn it over to our presenter for today, Michael Kirchner. Michael, thank you for being here. Hey, thank you, Laura. Uh, so let's start with um, some requirements if we're going to parallel. Um, when we want to tie two generators together, we're going to need access to the governor and voltage regulator circuits to be able to bias them to be able to increase power and increase excitation. So we need access to those systems. Uh, you need same phases, same voltage, same phase rotation. So those are all setup issues. And we want the alternators to be the same pitch. Um, if you have a two-thirds pitch alternator and a non-two-thirds pitch alternator, it can create some issues with circulating neutral currents where the third harmonic will circulate between the units. So almost all the manufacturers have done two-thirds pitch alternators historically, uh, except for a Caterpillar on some of their older machines, historically used some various uh, pitches. So that's something you always wanna be aware of if you're connecting and trying to parallel to an older Caterpillar machine. Some of the equipment that's necessary to parallel generators, we're gonna need a common place to tie all the generators together that we usually call the generator bus. We need some controls to align the phases. We call that process synchronizing. Uh, we need a switching device that we're actually gonna connect the sources together, uh, whether that's various different technologies we're gonna explore a little later. And then once the two power sources are connected together, we need to balance their power output. And finally, there needs to be some protection wrapped around the system such that if some of those control functions don't work correctly, the generator is tripped offline and shut down. So various protection in the system. So we're gonna start off by talking about synchronizing. Uh, synchronizing is the process of aligning phases. So what we find is the actual alignment of the, the rotors within the different machines. So the rotors, once we actually tie these two generators together, the rotors are gonna turn at the same speed and actually in almost identical phase orientations within the rotors. So the process of aligning the phases is very important to connecting the generators together. So it's a three-step process. The first step is we, you want your voltages to be close to the same. Uh, that avoids an inrush or an outrush of KVAR to match the voltages. Next, you want your speeds to be basically the same. So we want a slight bit of speed difference so the sine waves will come in and out of phase. A good slip frequency is a, about 0.1 hertz. So if, if, if we're paralleling to a source at 60 hertz, the oncoming generator is normally targeting something like 60.1. Uh, that allows the generator to come in and out of phase every 10 seconds and it makes for good repeatable synchronizing. So there are controllers that do synchronizing, automatic synchronizers. Historically, you could purchase them as a standalone item. 
for the more traditional switchgear solutions that are integrated into UL891 switchboards, there's typically a load share module that integrates the synchronizing function in, so it's a, comb a combined device, load share slash synchronizer. Um, so historically, uh, you had automatic synchronizing, but there was also the ability to manually synchronize. And the idea goes all the way back to, you know, that of some light bulbs. So looking at a light bulb connected between the gen bus and the oncoming generator, if there's voltage potential between those two points, you can actually see the light bulb burning very bright. When the light bulb goes out, you know the two sources are in phase. Now that's kind of crude. So a lot of traditional switchgear had these lights on them as a secondary check in case something went wrong, you could always rely lights on, lights off. Um, but was, what was more common was to use an actual synchroscope. A synchroscope actually is just a meter that tells you if your two sources are in phase. Our first polling question for today, when it comes to normal power switching, what device provides the most robustness? We're gonna put our answers on the screen. You can go ahead and choose power contactor with breaker protection, power breaker, insulated case breaker, molded case breaker with motor, with motor operator. You can go ahead and put your answers in. We'll collect those. A few more seconds here. All right, and it looks like most of you chose power contactor with breaker protection. Back to you, Mike. Yep. So let's let's kind of talk about that list a little bit. Um, we basically agree with you that you know there's a kind of a pecking order in our minds in terms of what's going to provide the most robustness when it comes to you know power switching, especially when you have a lot of operations, repeat operations, cyclical operations. So let's just start with a concept, breaker versus contactor. The design intent of a breaker really is overcurrent protection. So they're designed to snap open extremely aggressively to extinguish fault current. So that extremely aggressive operation of snapping open very hard to break fault current isn't really in line with optimization for lots of cyclic operation, on, off, on, off. Um, so really that kind of goes to contactor technology. Contactors aren't designed to break fault current. They're designed for normal current levels and they're designed for lots of operation. The benefit of combining contactor technology with an overcurrent breaker is you get the best of both worlds. Breaker provides the aggressive protection to snap open during a fault condition, but the power contactor does the normal day in day out opening and closing it also provides for some redundancy and that's going to be a key word that we want to focus on during this session redundancy in, in separating a generator from the bus if you only use a breaker like a power breaker insulated case or molded case if for some reason the contacts in that breaker arced and welded or the mechanism jammed you'd be stuck with that generator on the bus and not able to isolate and kick off a generator. So it is a benefit to be able to look at using contactor with breaker technology. Uh, at Generac, we use that approach up to 1,000 amps. And then when we go above 1,000 amps, we move to a UL1066 power breaker. We think the power breaker is the next best choice and then as you go down the line, really we think at the bottom of the list is molded case breakers with motor operators. What we're seeing in the marketplace is some of the suppliers out there in their integrated parallel systems have really dropped to that bottom rung of using a molded case breaker as a repetitive switching device, which we don't feel is necessarily the best fit for, uh, for the application. Just to kind of prove that point, this is just a list uh, of different style breakers from left to right. We have on the left column, a power breaker in the center column, an insulated case breaker. And on the right, we have a molded case. This is uh, from an Eaton catalog. 
Notice nowhere in here do they talk about cyclic operation or how many operations you can expect. Notice everything about a breaker is geared to what it's going to do relative to fault operations. And even maintenance is way down on the list. You know, when you look at molded case breakers, largely they're not a maintainable device. Uh, but uh, so that's kind of trying to illustrate the point that really op cyclic operation isn't uh, a lot in mind. Second polling question, when riding on a bike for two, what is the most challenging problem? Answers are up on the screen. Getting on the bike, pedaling at the same speed, balancing power output without arguing, or protecting against pushing the pedals in the reverse direction. You see the answers coming in. We're going to give you a few more seconds here. And it looks like for most, the most challenging problem is pedaling at the same speed. So this is a good analogy for us because this analogy works extremely well with power generation because Two people on a bike for two is very similar to two generators operating on the same bus. We have the same problems. Uh, so let's explore this a little bit. So when you're on a bike for two, the pedals are actually connected together with a chain. That chain forces the pedals to turn at the same speed. So pedaling at the same speed is not a problem on a bike for two because the chain ensures that. In generators, our synchronizing force forces the generators to turn at the same speed. So once we close the paralleling switches, that's basically like once we get on our bikes, once we connect together, the pedals have to go at the same speed, meaning the generators have to turn at the same speed. They're locked together. Usually where the problems occur, and some of you had said, how do we balance the power between these two people on this bike in ways that are equitable, in ways that don't re result in the two power sources, two people getting into an argument? And that's largely the problems we face in power generation. Synchronizing itself is a fairly easy process, but once the generators are connected together, we need to balance the KW which is the real power, which requires balancing the governor functions. And we have to balance the KVAR, which is the excitation control of the alternator, which is the voltage regulation system. If we balance the KW and the KVAR correctly, we'll end up with balanced amps or balanced KVA between the power sources. So just a quick look at the power triangle. So we do not have the ability to control amps directly. We want balanced amps out of the generator or proportionately balanced amps, but we have to actually control the real power, the engine, kilowatts, and the excitation system in the alternator, the KVAR. Should be interesting to note that in the power triangle here, theta is the angle uh, between uh, voltage and current, and the cosine of that angle is our power factor. If you know any two of these four, you know them all. The little beer glass in there is a nice analogy in that the real beer is, is, is the beer on the bottom. The foam on top is like the KVAR, and the KVA would be the full glass, making us think we have a full glass of beer when we know there's some foam built into there. So when we talk about real power systems and reactive power systems, uh, it's sometimes easy to focus on the real power system and know that they're symmetrical systems, meaning kilowatts is like KVAR and frequency is like voltage and governors are like regulators and engine fuel is like alternator excitation. We're gonna find that everything we talk about for the real power system can be also translated to the reactive power system just by substituting those words. Uh, most people, do better in talking about the real power system because it seems more concrete mentally. So we're going to focus on that side of the equation here. Just know that everything we're talking about could later be 
uh, assigned to a reactive power system discussion just with the change of these words. So when we share KW, um, one of the things we have to recognize is electrically, the load kind of demands its KW. And when it sucks current and, and power from the generator, the engine would naturally want to slow down. So the controls on the engine need to respond to that and push more fuel into the engine to keep frequency up. But the problem begins when we have multiple engines doing that and they're tied together and the balancing of those is something we're going to take a look at. So we want to really explore kind of three approaches. One is a very traditional approach called isochronous load sharing. Unfortunately, isochronous load sharing comes with some negatives. It comes with some perceived positives, but it also comes with some negatives. And some of the negatives of isochronous load sharing is single point system failures and stability issues. Then there's a really old concept, kind of developed in about 1880 called speed droop. Speed droop is inherently stable and it removes single point system failures, but it has a negative of not maintaining 60 hertz. So as you change load, your speed of your generators will actually go up and down or droop down. So the market has kind of tended to reject that. But speed droop brings some stability issues and removing of single point failure issues kind of to the forefront that if we could combine some of these ideas, maybe hybrid the approaches, we could create a system with enhanced stability, no single point failures, and maintain 60 hertz operation. So one of the challenges with isochronous, uh, isochronously balancing power between generators is each generator has a PID control loop that's trying to control engine speed. The problem we have is when we parallel generators together, we actually connect the speed output of both generators to a common bus, that little red link you see here. The result is we have the PID control, the integrators in the PID are going to try to drive fuel until there's a zero coming into the PID. Problem you have is you get some measurement error and you have tolerances of components. And what you would have is the generators would naturally want to fight each other if you left them in this configuration, because each PID is going to try to take control and it just doesn't work. So they would tend to fight each other if we didn't do something special. So historically, the way this was done was with load chair modules. Isochronous load chair module, this concept is about 40, 50 years old. Uh, it's basically putting a device on each generator that's going to tweak the speed reference of each of the governors. And it's going to communicate between the load share modules on a load share line. Historically, this was done with analog electronics. And more recently, some manufacturers still use analog electronics in, in their load share module approach. Uh, but most have gone to a digital communication between them. The problem we have, though, is if you lose the load share line, if you lose it, whether it's analog or digital, if you lose that communication, the generators cannot continue to operate in isochronous mode. They, a lot of some manufacturers at this point shut their systems down. If they lose their digital communications or lose their load share line, they say, well, we tried and they shut the whole system down. We think that's a bad choice. We really think that's a terrible choice. So you start to look back at history and you recognize, hey, you know, this old concept of speed droop, you know, these speed droop governors naturally shared load, so much so that the entire grid runs on this concept. So what speed droop governors do is they add a secondary feedback. They take power and they bring it back into the summing point. As a result, we get some downward sloping lines, which you can see on the left. And that downward slope in that line adds inherent stability, but 
what it also adds is the ability for power sources to inherently parallel with each other. That's why the grid largely uses this approach to bring generators onto the grid and allow them to support grid operation. The disadvantage of this approach is we lose speed as load increases. So what if we hybrid that approach? What if we took internally the concepts and stability of Droop and externally tweak their references whereby the generators naturally stayed isochronous or stayed at 60 Hertz? So with this approach, we can get the best of both worlds. We can get isochronous operation, inherent stability, and if we lose the outer control loop, the fine tuning of the load sharing is lost, but the generators will continue to operate. They will continue to share load. And the only thing we've given up is a slight plus and minus 1% speed error. We think this is the primary approach that should be looked at to achieve all three goals in terms of how do you parallel generators maintain maximum stability, but then also be able to handle a failure mode of your load share line and not shut the system down. This is the approach that Generac uses within their integrated paralleling systems. Our third polling question now up on the screen. Should well-designed paralleling systems provide inherent system level redundancy? Options are gonna come up. You can select yes, no, sometimes or uncertain Let's see the answers coming in keep on voting a few more seconds here all right it looks like most of you chose yes so when it comes to system redundancy there's a few places you know, that are mission critical that we want to look to maintain some redundancy. So when we talk about sharing load information between generators, one of the ways we can enhance that is to use redundant ethernet, loop ethernet, put an ethernet switch in each controller, whereby if you break the wire in any one spot or you have a shorted switch in any one shot, spot, you can still digitally communicate between generators. A lot of manufacturers out there will show ethernet, but then they, I call it the Walmart router approach. They'll show all of their generator controllers plugging into one ethernet switch. Well, when I unplug the ethernet switch or it fails, uh, all that communication's lost. Really the switches need to be built into the controls so you can communicate in a complete circle and you don't have one ethernet switch that can go down. The next level of redundancy is even if you fail comms, can you continue to operate? Well, if that's the case, you need to have a fallback mode, as we talked with the hybrid uh, approach, fall back into a droop mode of operation so the generators can continue to share power. But what about the load sequencing? So we believe that there should be a primary load sequencer that can be digital in, in nature. But what if we want some redundancy in our load sequencing? That redundant load sequencer probably should not just rely on comms because if you can lose comms in a system, you don't want your redundant system control basically to go down. So you could hardwire a single contact from each generator saying online. With that information, the redundant load sequencing can manage the loads even if comms were to fail in the system. So you're really starting to see a real belts and suspenders approach to this. Uh, traditional switchgear had a method where you could manually parallel, but if you really looked at what manually paralleling meant, all the things I put in the dashed boxes were what was replaced with human intervention when you went to manual paralleling. Notice even in manual mode, each of the generators required four functioning microcontrollers to be working for the generators to parallel. 
as manufacturers have integrated, needing to do manual paralleling has turned into basically telling the single controller on the generator, hey, parallel for me, would you? Because now when you only have one controller, it works or it doesn't. So instead of having four controllers that need to be working, you only need one. And that gets us to the point of uh, um, asking some uh, audience questions. And we had a few come in throughout the webinar. First one for you, Mike. How do you see the neutral bonding happening with the parallel generators? Uh, neutral bonding is usually done at a common point. So generators, neutrals will be pulled to a common point, whether that's a switchboard or some switch gear. And then at that point, that neutral would be bonded. It depends if you're using three pole or a four pole configuration. So if you're using um, a three pole configuration, the neutral that's all brought back to a single point is then carried back and bonded um, through the transfer equipment. It's carried back and bonded at the service. Uh, if it's a four pole configuration, usually in that equipment is where you'd make the bond between the combined neutrals and the ground, uh, the grounding conductor. What GenSec controls does Generac use for paralleling? Uh, we make our own. Um, so historically, we've been doing integrated generator paralleling since 2003. We actually led the market in making that market move. Uh, and uh, the controls that we've used there, we call our G panel. But within the last two years, we've launched a new series of controls, kind of the next evolution that we call uh, the power zone controller. Is there any concern of paralleling generators of different sizes? The generator control systems from us and others in the market work on a percentage basis. So when you're paralleling generators of different size, you always balance load based on a percent. So the they're both generators are at 50% load or 25% load, et cetera. So you don't, so you can, you take into account the size by doing everything in kind of a percentage way. Could the PLS still be used for redundant load management with power zone units via online signal coming from programmed generalays? So within our control platform, uh, we have a device, a load sequencing device, and, and we allow for redundancy there. So, and we always have actually going way back into about 2005. Um, the primary approach is the main load sequencer uses digital electronics, comms. Um, the backup controller, we've tended to hardwire to create redundancy between them. Uh, as we created our new hardware configurations, the load sequencer has the ability to accept both digital and hardwired inputs into a single device such that we could have a failure of communications in a data system and still have the ability to accept <clears throat> hardwired inputs. Are the same droop controllers the choice when paralleling with a utility or infinite bus? So when you parallel with an infinite bus, <clears throat> you have to use speed droop or what they call an import export controller, which basically creates a external control loop that's gonna monitor KW and KVAR and basically turn the governor and regulator into KW and KVAR controllers. So uh, generally when you talk about grid paralleling, you need to, you can't operate isochronously against the grid. You have to have some sort of way to bias the governor based on kilowatts or based on speed feedback being speed droop. All right, and we're about to hit our time limit for today. We are going to stay on to answer questions that are still coming in, but for those of you who need to step out at this time, I want to remind you that you'll be getting an exit survey as you leave today. If you can go ahead and put those answers in, um, and you'll be getting an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this live webinar as well as a link to request your free in-person PDSS training. Um, if you have any additional questions that come up, you can always email them to indweb at generac.com and we'll make sure that those get answered for you. The last thing I wanna mention is the next webinar we're having on May 20th. Um, this is gonna be on maximizing transfer switch reliability. 
Topics will include ensuring adequate fault current capability, selecting the right transfer switch for the application, evaluating different switching technologies, and comparing and contrasting in-phase in versus delayed transitions. Again, if you need to step off, thank you for joining us today. And now we're gonna head back to the questions. Um, next one came in, Mike. I have an existing unit. What's required to add another, another to that system? So it depends on what suppliers you're going to. If you're gonna mix suppliers the way you typically parallel generators together with different manufacturers is a very traditional approach with load share modules and traditional gear. That tends to be the most common way it's done. If you're adding um, paralleling from the same manufacturer, you really have to look at what control ecosystem they have on the generator. Was the ecosystem currently supporting paralleling where you can simply add another unit uh, a lot of times we recommend customers, even when buying a single engine generator, to look towards the future and consider setting up the controls and maybe a parallel switch on an integrated parallel unit for future expansion to a second or third unit. Does Generac have wiring diagrams available for consulting engineers to use in their engineering designs and drawings for construction? Uh, yes, uh, we do have um, different uh, schematical representations of different power system configurations. Also, we have the complete wiring schematics for the generators themselves, the internal wiring. But I think you're talking more the interconnect wiring uh, and system layout. We have a, a collection of drawings that shows different possible configurations that generators can be interconnected in. Um, so we do have a bunch of interconnect diagrams that can be uh, reviewed and looked at. Are there any disadvantages to paralleling generators with different fuel types? Uh, actually not. Uh, a good uh, integrated paralleling system can accomplish, uh, you know, manage the, the different response characteristics of gas versus diesel, at least our system can. I shouldn't speak for everybody. Because of the inherent stability we've designed into our system, the fact that a diesel will grab load quicker than a gas gen set uh, doesn't matter relative to our paralleling system in that the controls manage the load sharing quite nicely, even though they respond differently. Is there a break point in the generator sizing for monolithic versus paralleling cost-wise for install and life cycle cost? Uh, that's a great question. We tend to think that your sweet spot for diesel generators is in the about 400 to 600 kW range and maybe as high as 750. So you kind of look at that range. So if, if the sweet spot goes down to 400, two by 400 is an 800 kW. So we tend to think of the market 600, maybe 750 and below, a single engine gen set is fairly dominant. And then when, when we start looking at the market 800 kW and above, you can start to attack that market with redundancy, scalability, and generally a little better value by using integrated paralleling. In other words, three 500s instead of a 1500 or two fours instead of an eight and actually increase customer uh, value in terms of redundancy, scalability, uh, serviceability, and the really, and the bottom line as well. Is speed control only a concern with standby applications? Uh, speed control uh, is a concern for standby, meaning isolated from the grid. Uh, anytime we're running isolated from the grid, we have to control speed and we have to control voltage. When we tie a power generator into the grid, generally we still are seeing speed and voltage in the control loops of the governor and the voltage regulator. So they, the controllers in the control system will still respond to changes in uh, speed and voltage. Uh, that's why there's outer control loops that need to be put in, whether it's import-export control or changing the mode of operation from isochronous to speed droop. But basically, some other mode of operation needs to be put in play 
to allow the generators to be able to share load with basically the grid. Can paralleling controls work with Generac in addition to generators from other manufacturers? I, the answer to that is with our power zone controllers, most definitely, we've created input bias capabilities so we can look at various uh, various uh, different equipment options to allow us to use maybe more of a traditional approach to mix and mass mac, mix and match manufacturers. Does this seminar apply to medium voltage generator paralleling? When it comes to medium voltage, you kind of got a foot on each each um, world. The, because with medium voltage, you typically are using vacuum breaker switching, so you're going to have a big cabinet of gear, ANSI gear, for the switching side of it. And that cabinet then has the ability to have controls load chair modules placed into that equipment, or the con control could still stay out at the generator level. So it can be done either way with medium voltage in that the switching is going to be in, a, in some gear. The actual generator control could still be done at a generator level and just issuing the commands to open and close the vacuum breaker. When it comes to medium voltage, one of the real advantages integrated paralleling brings is the ability to take multiple low voltage machines, parallel them together and feed a step up transformer. And by doing that, you're removing a lot of the cost associated with medium voltage alternators as well as vacuum breakers. And it becomes a much more serviceable component. So we see a lot of applications in, I'm gonna call it, you know, you know, your typical maybe six meg and below market when medium voltage is needed using low voltage generators, feeding one or multiple step up transformers create very elegant solutions. How fast can you parallel two generators to megawatt size? Is 10 second achievable? Uh, typically when we're looking at multiple generators in 10 seconds, we see that's real feasible in the mid-range diesel products, it's a bit of a stretch as you move up to two meg to bring multiple two megs on in 10 seconds. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be done, but you really have to look at the control platforms that are on the two meg gen sets, how tightly and quickly they come up to speed. So one of the big variables is just speed to bus for the first unit. If it takes the generator the engine a while to come up to speed before you can close into the bus, it makes it more challenging to get two parallel than 10. The reality is there's very few applications that need that much power parallel than 10 seconds. The most dominant application for needing power on the bus in 10 seconds is hospitals because they have a large emergency system made up of life safety and critical circuits. But even in the big urban hospital market, we typically see a single 1500 or single two meg take the emergency system load and then the other units parallel to it to pick up e the non-essential, uh, essential equipment and non-essential equipment branches. So needing to parallel big units in 10 seconds typically isn't a real application need. Um, uh, from a code standpoint. When you do load shedding, what happens if one generator fails? Does all load transfer to the other generator and would that bring down the other generator if the load is more than the capacity of the generator size? Is there any way to prevent this shutdown? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when we had this slide where we talked about load sequencing and we kind of talked about redundant load sequencing, usually when you use parallel generation, you want some sort of active device that will sequence loads on and sequence loads off based on a priority scheme. The idea would be when the first unit closes to the bus, we don't want to pick up the load right away either necessarily. Maybe the emergency system and then we wait maybe for more generator capacity before taking another load hit. Depends on the system. But the reverse is also true. If a generator goes down, 
we may want to look at, do we need to actively shed load? Maybe we need to shed load on the first unit going down so we don't overload the remaining units, but we may have achieved some N plus one redundancy. So we maybe can wait till the second unit goes down. So really that's where that load sequencing comes in. And all of our integrated paraline systems that we sell uh, traditionally have included a load sequencing device to make that process extremely easy for customers. We simply interlock a permissive and a load shed into, a trans into some various transfer switches would be fairly typical. Is it possible and financially reasonable to parallel existing gen sets with new to increase capacity? Uh, the technically feasible, yes, uh, but cost feasible, you have to take a look at it. Typically, when you're mixing and matching different equipment, as if they're not in the same control ecosystem, you tend to fall back into a traditional switchgear world. And in the traditional switchgear world, you're starting to pay $40,000 a section. And you're looking at a couple of weeks to get it in, you know, wired up, installed, a week or two to get it commissioned. Uh, it's an expensive process. So sometimes if we're in the mid to smaller range products, what we find is uh, you could repurpose, let's say, a four or 500 kW gen set into a different application and maybe start with three by 400 or three by 500 with integrated paraline and be money ahead. So it, it kind of depends on the application. So you have to do a cost analysis of each, but at least in the mid-range products, a lot of times trying to add one isn't real cost feasible. Um, as you start to move up into larger and larger equipment, uh, then the cost of the traditional paraline gear doesn't dwarf the economics as, as badly. Can an SD, SG be converted into an MD, MG? So that is some Generac nomenclature. SD stands for single engine diesel and SG single engine gas. And M for us means modular or can parallel. So it depends on the age of the equipment uh, and, uh, and have we done those designs for paralleling those units. So the answer is it depends. And I would say consult your local distributor and they can work with you on that. Uh, I would say anything we've done over 200 kilowatts in about the last 15 years, the answer is gonna be typically yes. And there's a couple of questions here that talk about reaching out to Generac. I just wanna remind everyone, you can reach out to that IND web at generac.com and we'll make sure that those questions get to the right place. Um, another question, how many gens could we put in parallel and if so, in, in how many levels of synchronization? So when we parallel gens are the Generac ecosystems for integrated paralleling that we launched in 2003 could do 15. Our current ecosystem, uh, we're not even sure what the limit is. It's something in excess of 30 units. When paralleling same model generators, there's no specific need to use resistance grounding. That is using solidly grounded neutral will not result in unacceptable circulating currents. So as long as all of the generators are two thirds pitch, uh, you can solidly uh, ground. And actually that is the most common grounding we see for low voltage paralline systems is solidly grounded neutrals. Uh, the medium voltage paralline world and medium voltage generators in general is typically where we see more resistive grounding taking place. So as long as the alternators are the same pitch, primarily two thirds pitch, uh, you don't have issues with circulating uh, neutral currents. At what percentage do you want the minimum load of the generator? Uh, typically in any application, we'd like to keep generators loaded above 30%, just to minimize wet stacking effects and promote good generator health. Um, it should be noted that spark ignited generators don't wet stack. So that's less of an issue on a natural gas generator compared to a diesel. So a real light load operation is not uh, as detrimental on 
gaseous generators and diesels. All right, we're going to do our last question here. Are there common points of failures in transfer switch and multiple generator power supply, and how can this be eliminated? Um, so when you're integrating the transfer equipment and generators together from a power standpoint, the generators from a control system standpoint rely on their cranking batteries. So the entire control system from a power standpoint uh, is tied to the cranky batteries. Transfer switches typically uh, will use incoming AC power or they may have a battery built in. Uh, a lot of the switches and infrastructure that we have traditionally looked at using has also had the ability, if it does have a DC source at a transfer switch, has the ability to bring some redundant DC in from one of the cranking batteries of one of the generators through a blocking diode. So one of the things you wanna take a look at is, you know, how's the hardware working? Uh, transfer switches typically from a control standpoint are usually have their own independent power capabilities. Uh, from a systemic standpoint or from a three-phase power cabling standpoint, the transfer switches uh, represent a path of power from the generator bus to the loads. If that path is highly critical, a lot of times they'll look at dropping in a bypass isolation switch on that power path. If it's a less critical power path, that power path is on a single point failure device, which is the transfer switch, which is always the case whenever we use transfer switches. Um, so it becomes a question of, you know, how important that particular power path is to that given customer. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay. Great questions, everyone. Again, if you have any additional that come up or if we didn't get to yours today, go ahead and email us. We'll make sure you get those answers. We're here to help. Um, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Have a great afternoon.